I'm going to, I'm going to talk about CAR-T toxicity. I, I think that there might be a bit of duplication of the, the end of the talk I just heard, but I'll, I'll talk about the way we do things at King's and it's, it's always interesting to hear different centres practices. Am I going or not? Um, I'm sure this has been, been covered, but it's just to highlight, uh, you know, that one of the main things about CAR-T is it will cause long-term B-cell aplasia, which is um, relevant for later on in the talk. And again, I'm sure this has already been covered, but I suppose just the things that I would highlight uh, just just that are relevant. The co-stimulated domain is 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 really important for the two main products. I think the way the T cell is stimulated really is one of the main drivers in it and why these two CAR T cells behave quite differently in terms of toxicity. It's CAR tests we've been doing for Mantle. I know you've heard about Mantle already today. I think there's a fairly good chance that Tocatus is going to be approved for ALL, um, maybe not that long away. So uh, that's going to be, I think, a different beast altogether. I, I suspect the toxicity for Tocatus in ALL is going to be significant, um, which makes these sort of talks all the more relevant. Um, Lysocell is this other CAR-T, which um, it's CD1941 BB, so it's essentially the same as Kim Raya, but it's different in that when they collect PBMCs, they, they separate the CD4s and the CD8s, transduce them separately, and then bring them back together at the end with a one-to-one -one ratio. So the, the data that's come through, the toxicity profile is probably better, but I, I mean, there, there's also a commercial aspect. Uh, the, the company just don't have the manufacturing ca capability to service Europe, so I think we're not going to get access to Lysacel. Um, I mean, definitely not next year and probably, I mean, the earliest will be 2024. So I think we're stuck talking about the three products that you've you'll, you'll already heard about today. Um, this is the full list of CAR-T toxicities, some of the main ones. Uh, I mean, I would highlight that the, the old language for neurotoxicity would be CRESS. I, I would not use that particular term anymore. Um, I would stick with ICANN, so immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome. Um, there's medium term side effects, which are very relevant for the long term non relapse mortality. And there's now quite a bit of data, that, well, there's loads of real world data. So there's lots of UK real world data that we've collected that we can reflect on. And some specific things about what we do in, in very extreme cases, the, the, the really severe toxicity patients. I mean, this is just a standard standard CAR-T pathway, which we do at King's. I think what's, what, what interests me about the pathway in different centres is um, we're, we're very much a self-hub and spoke sort of model. So if people need bridging, we would generally try and get the local hospital to do it. But I know there's some CAR-T centres that will try and take over the whole thing. Um, just to remember, patients can't drive for eight weeks post CAR-T infusion. They do not have to inform the DVLA, they can just start redriving eight weeks and one day after afterwards but it's very important that you do tell them that and a little bit about being close to the hospital the the smpc actually states that patients have to be within two hours of the hospital for four weeks or a month post CAR-T infusion if you look at the nhs england commissioning documents they actually added in a little caveat that said whilst we're Whilst we're rolling out services and we're gaining experience, uh, it would be advised to keep patients within one hour. I have to say, I, I've actually recently re requested that 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 comment is removed from NHS England documents because I don't think we're inexperienced anymore. And I think we should do what the SNP says, which is allow people to be within two hours. But obviously on a patient by patient basis, how sensible they are, what the carer is like, you know, what the, where they live. But um, this is something that we're actually looking to change because, you know, a lot of my patients come from Kent and that's automatically over one hour. So it would it would be quite helpful for us to, to remove unnecessary energy England rules. Um, we've seen tables like this, so it, it's really just to highlight what the trial said. Uh, but I'm mostly going to focus on what the, the 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 real world, the UK real world data says, because it's very different, although within certain themes. So we know that with CD19, CD28, CAR-T, neurotoxicity is going to be higher. In the pivotal trials, ZIMA2, ZIMA1, any grade was 63, 64%, grade 3 and above, 31, um, 32%. 
and just significantly less neurotoxicity with the 41 bb cars so of tisogen and lysosel. Um, and this is also reflected in tocilizumab abuse and steroid use. So apologies if this has been co covered in detail, but I, I think this is really, really important to get right. Um, because personally, I don't like being called up in the middle of the night without precise information. Um, CRESS, as has been talking about CRS, is the old terminology. You know, there was a big effort from multiple um, CAR-T centres, like the really important ones, to uh, find some common terminology. And that came through the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. So I think, I think as a UK standard, we should use this terminology. Um, it is predominantly comes from like clinical trial, uh, the way we talk about clinical trial adverse events. So grade zero means you don't have it. Grade five means death from that toxicity. Um, again, it's 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 helpful to highlight. You know, grade zero means they don't have that toxicity, and to write it in the notes because when you go back, if you try to order these things, um, it is very helpful when people say that you don't have something rather than just commenting on when you do have something. Um, so grade one to grade two will be managed on the ward, grade three to four will be managed in intensive care. <clears throat> grade one CRS is literally just a fever, 38 degrees Celsius. And grade two is the key, usually the key decision making point because it's fever plus hypotension or a new oxygen requirement. Now, obviously hypertension is very obvious. The nurses will always highlight that, but it's quite easy for people to have two litres nasal cannula snuck on them overnight and no one really mentioned it. So that that also makes them grade two, and that's important because that equals intervention. I'll talk a bit about grade three to four and more complicated patients in a bit. Obviously, this is all cytokine mediated. IL-6 is the main one, but there are many other main players. Um, IL-1, although it doesn't go up very high, actually is very important, um, more probably in the early cascade. And I'll come back to that when we talk about anakinra. And just thinking about how the drugs work, again, something else to come back to. Um, Tocilizumab blocks the receptor. So you do get a sense when you have someone with quite severe ongoing CRS that the, the effect gets saturated and, and, that, and that does very much fit with the mechanism of action of the drug, um, which is why just giving toti 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 often isn't the right strategy it's you have to add in other things so the drugs that are important um obviously tocilizumab um you know CAR -T is quite unusual in that the license came combined with the use of tocilizumab license specifically for this indication um so toti will, will, will block the receptor but but you know when things get really bad and we want to add in other drugs um i mean our first line um alternative is anakinma, which, which blocks the IL-1. Uh, it's, it's an IL-1 receptor antagonist, and it, it does, in animal models, crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is useful. But so tuximab we have given a little bit um, in very, very sick patients, and it does it does at least have a bit of logic to it in that it, it will bind to IL-6, also crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, Lenzilumab is a drug that's in trials, so we don't really need to talk too much about that, but uh, it blocks GMCSF, which is very important in the early um, cytokine cascade. Um, OK, so immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome icons. Uh, I mean, basically, you can do pretty much anything, um, but it is quite distinct. I mean, I, it really is very different to things that you see on hematology wards. Um, obviously, you'll all be used to seeing septus delirium. I find those sort of patients quite confused, agitated, um, a bit difficult to manage. I find ICANs that patients in general are are very are very different. They they tend to be quite placid. It's very verbal, not being able to speak. I think the typical appearance I would say is somebody just sat in bed looking around the room not being able to communicate, but actually being quite tranquil. I mean, there are variations, of course. But I would say that is the predominant phenotype of this type of encephalopathy. And, and I, I just think it's very, I just don't think there's anything else in Hemonc that looks like that, really. Um, it's graded with, with the I-score, um, which is just a mini mental state, state examination out of 10. Uh, so grade one is just dropping one point, 
Um, and again, that's important depending on what your how, how you decide your local protocol to be in terms of steroid interventions. Um, because it's usually, it, it starts often very much with speech and language. I, I mean, it usually starts in a very vague way. So you, you obviously get to know patients quite well coming into CAR-T. It's quite an intense pathway and they just don't seem right. I mean, they just they just become much less chatty uh, when it's starting. And also, you know, not using an iPhone or a smartphone um, requires a certain amount of and eye coordination. I think that's also something that you know, if you ask them, have you been able to text your loved one today? And they say they can't. I always, I always find that um, a bit suspicious. As soon as my window, the train is too loud. Trains. All right, so this is the way we do it. And, and I'm just highlighting how we've how we've changed. So when we started the CAR-T program, NHS England were really strict about tocilizumab usage. It specifically said you're only allowed to give tocilizumab for grade two. So you had to wait for fever, hypotension or hypoxia. Um, and that's what we did for the first two years of the program. And when COVID started, um, there was, well, we all, we all remember how that was. And there was huge pressure for us to keep people out of intensive care. So NHS England just very, very quickly backtracked and just said, look, um, just use your judgment um, and they removed the rule. So we are allowed to give tocilizumab now and be reimbursed for grade one or grade two CRS. And that's important, I think, because it allows us to identify patients who are more at risk of uh, rapid deterioration or people who are less, uh, people, who, people who are more frail. Um, so we certainly do give tocilizumab for grade one quite a bit now, actually. And if you just think about it, I mean, I, I tell the registrar, please just go eyeball the patient and just tell me what they look like, because grade one CRS can be, you know, a young bloke, first night after CAR T infusion, 138 blip, looks completely well. I mean, these people don't need an intervention. Grade one CRS can also be, you know, temperature 40, 40, 40, borderline tachycardia, borderline hypotension in a 75 year old. That's still grade one CRS, but I would treat that because that's just going to get worse and that patient is is not quite so robust. So context is everything. Um, so when I teach the, the, the registrars at King's, I, I'm very insistent on a few things. One, you if you're going to phone someone in the middle of the night, you must know what the CRS and ICANN's grade is, and you must have just eyeballed the patient and just give me a, a sense of how they look and you know what the trend in the in the temperature chart has been. Grade three and grade four CRS um, is an ICU affair. I mean, we, we very linked in with our ICU department. They come to our departmental meeting once a week. We talk about the CAR-T patients that are in. We would very rapidly escalate um, steroids um, if people don't respond to tocilizumab. I mean, the other thing to mention about tocilizumab is, is you can only give it every eight hours. <clears throat> um, it takes an hour to infuse. So if you see a person with like grade two CRS, quite low blood pressure, um, you know, that they're probably not going to improve for two hours, even once you've made that decision to treat them. So you do have to wait a little bit. And if, you know, they're deteriorating, they're getting worse, um, you know, that's that's the time where you could add in the dose of DEX, an early dose of DEX. You know, say you're four hours post the dose of TOSI and they're not improving because you can't you can't you can't bring forward the second dose of TOSI. And it, it, that, that sort of addition of a dose of DEX I find particularly helpful when you're you know dealing with a person who's probably on their way to intensive care and they, they don't look very stable but we would rapidly increase to DEX QDS um, and yeah obviously ITU lead on decisions about vasopressors and things like that I mean it with 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 access cell it's, it's pretty much all blood pressure I, I, with the mantle patient Mantle patients, I mean, maybe they just get more capillary leak because I've seen a lot more patients with mantle CAR-T requiring oxygen requirements, non-invasive ventilation, which I think is just not very typical um, with Axacel and and um, Tisogen. Um, but that's, I mean, that's my anecdotal experience. Now, again, when COVID happened, we made a decision to, to change our CAR-T toxicity management protocol because before we um, had grade two ICANs as a trigger for the first dose of dexamethasone. And there's quite there's been quite a bit of discussion in, in you know from CAR T centers and particularly MD Anderson um, 
the the latter in the first author of the Zimmer One publication. He he's quite keen on this, and I I I I, I basically just agree. I copied what he said because I I, I just thought it, think it's incredibly helpful. So when we when we when we changed when COVID happened and we we just reviewed everything, um, we decided to change the grade one icons as the first dose of Dex. So that's not a very high benchmark. I mean, that's just dropping one score on the ICE score. So, and often it's very subjective because the first thing that goes on an ICE score is usually the handwriting. So you end up with a patient who's quite oriented, can obviously pass, answer simple questions. You ask him to write a sentence and you just get a squiggle. And then you have to decide how bad does a squiggle have to be before you give them a point or not. And that is subjective and it's just clinical judgment. So it, it, also, it goes with the Kepra decision. Some centres will will give everybody antiepileptic prophylaxis from from either lymphodepletion or infusion. That isn't our practice. We've always done it with ICANs, but I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. I think you just set a protocol and stick to it. But because of the way we do it, what I've said is, if you give someone a dose of Dex, then you have to load them with Kepra at the same time. Those two things have to go together, um, and they, we would always do an urgent CT head. Um, our our threshold for doing a lumbar puncture would usually be grade two ICANs. Um, I think if if they're very temporarily grade two and they respond very quickly to steroids, then I wouldn't necessarily do it. Um, but I think if it carries on for more than twenty four hours, then we definitely would do it. And we would usually order the MRI pretty early on. We pretty much do still do the MRIs, although I I, I take the point from the previous speaker. We often don't we often don't see anything at this time point. Grade three and grade four ICANs is just about escalation of steroids. They need to be in intensive care. Um, they don't necessarily need intubating. We do we do try and watch them a lot longer now before intubating. It. Unless it, obviously there's an issue with their GCS, then they need intubating. But if they're just confused um, and a bit vacant um, and not able to answer questions in a nice score, that's not on its own an indication for intubation. Um, and what's being important for us, I think, is, is the addition of anakinra. So we've always been very keen on this. I mean, our CAR T program started with a phase one um, Alocar program prior to the commercial products. So we, we we were always very familiar with anakinra. Um, so for us, we would generally add anakinra in after 24 hours of high dose steroids with no clinical improvement, which is probably quite a bit earlier than most centers are doing it. Um, but I'll I'll show you some data at the end about 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 what's happening in this space. Um, so I, well, I mean, th there was a huge effort uh, in MTCP to collect all the real world data. The sub project um, that I led was just looking at CAR T toxicity management from from the UK data perspective. So this was presented at Ash last year, um, and at that point, <clears throat> at that point. I mean, the real the, the the research question that we wanted to to interrogate that our UK data from was really about this anxiety about whether giving steroids affects PFS or OS. Um, so we looked at dosing timing, duration of steroids, um, the effect on PFS OS, and we also tried to just look for some risk risk factors for identify identifying people who are high risk of CAR T toxicity. Um, so, I mean, it obviously relied incredibly on on the help of the of the centres to to contribute to the data. So, at the point where we submitted this, there was 341 patients, and you probably already know that there seems to be a UK preference for Axacel. So, the majority of patients have had Axacel, and then the distinct minority have had uh, Tisogen, um, which has different toxicity profiles. So, this is the UK data. This is what has been done in the NHS, um, and I think. I think the key <clears throat> numbers to look at, I mean, I think grade three and above CRS and ICANs are, are sort of benchmark figures uh, in terms of safety and quality. So actually, when you look at the two products, uh, there's not actually that much difference in terms of grade three and above CRS. And then there is this difference in grade three and above ICANs. I mean, we expect that, we knew that, so that's, the, that's the difference between the two products. But I think you have to remember that in Zimba 1, this number, 21%, was 32%. So a real world practice, is actually proving safer than the clinical trial data, which is which is very reassuring. I mean, that's the UK data. I mean, at the King's percentage is about 15%, uh, but we're a quite high throughput centre, so we've seen a lot of patients. Um, and what, what's what's leading to that? So um, we are giving a lot more dexamethasone for Axacel than for, for Tisogen um, nationally, and we're also giving it for much longer, so eight days compared to four days. 
this is just a graphical representation of um, when these drugs are used and how long for. So the typical day for starting tocilizumab, the most common days were day plus one, day plus four. Um, the typical starting for steroids for cytokine release syndrome is day plus four. And typical start date for starting steroids for eye cancer is day plus five. This is the national data. So obviously, if you phone the consultant, it's very helpful to say this person is day plus four post axacel because I think that just tells you that they, they do need a treatment decision. Um, so we tried to see if giving steroids for CAR-T toxicity management um, resulted in a difference in outcome. Um, so by progression-free survival um, and overall survival, there was no significant differences um, if you give steroids or you don't give steroids. Um, that's probably a bit crude. So we did some more subset analysis, um, which is here, um, which is a very busy slide, but things we tried to look for were um, giving st a steroid dose of more or less than the median, uh, steroid timing in the first seven days or the next seven days, or steroid duration of uh, less than seven days or, or more than seven days. Um, and really the same things keep coming out in that steroids um, don't affect outcome um, and even when you look at subset analysis, which is reassuring, actually. I, I mean, I think there is a, I think there is a subset of patients who have very, ter very terrible CAR T toxicity that have lots of steroids that don't have a good outcome. But when you look at it from the national, you know, in the national data, all of the patients, I think giving steroids, we have not demonstrated that giving steroids would, 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 um, results in a worse um, efficacy outcome for CAR T. Now. We also looked for risk factors for toxicity because I think it's helpful to identify a group of patients who you, you think are more likely to get worse toxicity. So when we look by univariate analysis, um, this is the factors that came up. So we found that younger people had more toxicity, but actually I must say this very disputed in real world data. I've seen like the French data says the opposite. So. I'm not sure how much to take that, but certainly LDH, high LDH on infusion day is something that keeps coming up, extranodal disease, um, response to bridging being stable or progressive disease. But when you stick all of it into multivariate analysis, the things that keep coming up as being very important for identifying a high risk group of patients is an ECOG uh, performance status of more than zero, uh, immediately starting liver depletion, an LDH greater than, uh, greater than normal on the infusion day, uh, is predictive of vikings. Uh, I find that quite helpful because we always do. Um, I mean, our our set of kings is is on day zero. No CAR T patient proceeds with infusion until they've been seen by the attending consultant. They all have like really early morning bloods done, so the LDH CRP would all be there. So you can see on on day zero what the what the LDH is, and it's I think it's just helpful just to say think oh okay this is somebody who's more likely to get severe toxicity, and then um, we always identify. In the run into CAR T, pre lymphoid depletion, and CAR T MDT, we look at the PET scan and we characterize the response to bridging. Patients with a response to bridging of stable or progressive disease are more likely to require high dose steroids. So, again, you know, I mean, it just makes sense. These are patients who have very refractory progressive disease. And so I think the more proliferative patients are more likely to have worse CAR T toxicity. And what is also interesting about this group of risk factors is these are also risk factors that predict poor outcome. So actually we do have this group of patients, um, low performance status, high LDH, progressing to bridging, who are less likely to have a good CAR T outcome and more likely to have severe CAR T toxicity. Uh, this is the main slide, the main chart that I wanted to show you on the left. And I just think it's interesting if you just plot progression free survival, but separate the groups into the worst CRS grade that the patient had, you see quite a marked trend, which is so grade zero in blue means the person didn't have CRS. Um, grade, the green line is grade three to four, so this sort of severe types of CRS. Um, and the patients that do the best are the ones that have grade one to two CRS. So there is this sort of sweet spot where we want patients to have CRS, but we want it to be on the ward, manageable, not going to intensive care. But equally, this narrative that you hear from from allografters, where you know you need to say well, you need a bit of GBHD for this to work. I mean, you also need a bit of. I think by this 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 grade zero curve. It's just showing me that you you do need CRS for 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 this to work. Certainly with Axacel, anyway. It might be different with different products. 
Um, with ICANNs, uh, the more marked interesting curve is the overall survival curve. So people that have severe ICANNs are more likely to, to have poor survival outcomes. And, and, and we don't know exactly why that is. I mean, I think some of that might be failure to be able to proceed to another line of therapy if they relapse. So in terms of non-relapse mortality, this is the UK data for the first couple of years. Um, and you can see there's a big difference between the two products. I, 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 I mean, there's been a there's been a um, there's been a, an abstract accepted to ash um, actually uh, from the from the NCCP comparing the first half of the CARTI program to the second half of the CARTI program, and it's really interesting because basically the UK outcomes uh, for the for the latter two years are significantly better than the first two years. So I think there is a learning curve, and we have improved. Um, and Axacel does re result in more non-relapse mortality than Tisogen. Um, these are the things we've seen. I mean, some of these things will be steroid related. Obviously, COVID we all know about. Um, COVID seems to be much less of a, a big a big issue now, um, even in people who've just, I mean, one of my patients just had just had COVID like four weeks post CAR T, just as soon as she went home and she's absolutely fine. So I think I think the COVID issue really has changed. Um, there is um, there are secondary cancers happening in the background. We knew that from the trials um, and they need reporting because it's useful to get trends in this issue. Um, uh, something that uh, I have a couple of patients like this who I just found completely fascinating. So we, we wrote the first one up, um, published it in a sort of gastro journal because um, it's just fascinating. We had this 51 year old um, history of refractory transform follicular. She's never had bowel disease. Um, of lymphoma and she's never had bowel disease like inflammatory bowel disease um coming into car t so she had a lot of disease coming in and and about three to four weeks post car t infusion she she developed uh, really bad diarrhea type times 20 watery constant um and her, her one month pet scan um, showed her to be in remission but with with, with the pancolitis uh, flexi sig showed an atypical colitis with diffuse inflammation and an extensive t-cell infiltrate and unfortunately, we don't have um, the immuno antibody set up uh, to see if they were CAR T cells. But I'm I'm actually calling this CAR T colitis because I've seen it again in a very similar way. Um, and both patients are now on vidalizumab under gastro in the long term and have responded to it. Um, so how we are manipulating the immune system um, is is certainly of interest. I must stress this is my personal opinion. This is just um, from my experience at King's. Um, and I would say there is a hierarchy in toxicity. And I think when you see patients, it's it's, it's helpful to keep this in mind. Tisogen for lymphoma is a very low toxicity product. Um, we do not see severe ICANs with this product. It's very unlikely to have severe ICANs with this product. Um, our intensive care rate um, is very low. Um, and these intensive care admissions are very minor. Um, Axacel, um, I always consent pay patients to say that they have a, a third will end up in intensive care. Um, with Tocatus, we've certainly seen more sick patients, although it's still you know, such a small indication, so it's it's a small number of patients. Um, but certainly uh, the, the CRS feels different with Mantle, more, more oxygen, um, more metabolic disturbance. Um, then with high grade. Tisogen um, for young adults is a fairly niche thing because we just don't see very many of these patients because obviously they do so well with chemotherapy. And I think my impression of reading um, the, the, is it Zuma 3? The, the, the Zuma study for Tocatus is I think we will see significant um, CAR T toxicity um, when we start giving Tocatus to patients with refractory ALL. Uh, last time I audited our intensive care experience looked a bit like this. So of the people that went to intensive care, actually half didn't really end up having an intensive care intervention. Obviously, they had an excellent one to one nursing, doses, steroids, good fluid balance, you know, all of that stuff. But actually, they didn't require anything additional. Um, so about a quarter requiring vasopressors and a quarter, they're really very sick people, intubated, ventilated. Um, so this is this is quite I find this quite reassuring because most people's intensive expert intensive care experiences is, is not too bad really particularly if you compare like to an allograft patient going to ITU. So I'm going to do it. Do I have time? Yeah, I do have time. I'm going to do a quick case because it it shows a few points that I just wanted to comment on. So this is a mantle patient. 
uh, long history, previously had an autographed fit, was a previously was a tennis player, um, had been on Ibrutinib, done, done really well on Ibrutinib, he'd been on Ibrutinib for three years, um, and then was starting to relapse slowly. Um, so he had a PET scan, that he actually just has low volume relapse, but he was clearly progressing on Ibrutinib, and I think it's better to just, at this point, just intervene as early as possible because it's only going to get worse. Um, so he had lymph depletion um, in what was October, last, last, last October, so he tolerated all of that very well. We do lymph depletion as an outpatient at King, so now, well, before we were admitting on on the night before CAR-T infusion, actually now uh, we've changed that, so we're doing CAR-T infusions in ambulatory care, and we're admitting in the afternoon after CAR-T infusion, so we're trying to keep people out as long as possible. He was initially fine. Um, the CRS often starts a little bit later with, with Takatis, with Mantle, um, so he initially had grade one, CRS, but I think he had quite persistent fever, so we did treat with TOSI. Then it progressed to grade two, so he definitely had to have TOSI. Um, he had a third dose, and then we added in some steroids because it was ongoing. Um, and then things settled. He had quite refractory hiccups, which is a bit unusual, but not obviously ICANS. And then day plus 13, um, he developed very, very typical ICANS symptoms. His ice score dropped, grade two ICANS. So uh, we've talked about this already. Uh, basically, we would treat grade one ICANS with a stat dose of DEX. Um, and in his case, he had grade two ICANS. So we definitely gave him DEX. Um, so I think he had one. I think that maybe that was in the afternoon. And then the next day, we rapidly escalated it because he really wasn't looking very much better. Um, our practice is to do an EEG um, routinely on about day plus eight. If they're completely fine, then we often try and defer it. I have to say, EEGs have not been massively helpful because basically they pretty much always show slow wave encephalopathy. Obviously, we're doing it to exclude other things, so particularly status. I've never seen status when we when we've done an EEG. The MRI was normal. He had CSF done, which was fairly unremarkable. Um, and he had fluctuating um, con fluctuating ice scores over the next seven days. So we added in anakinra early. And we also added in Siltuximab because he wasn't getting better um, quickly and he, we also gave him some methyl pred. Uh, he was on ITU for all of this uh, and day plus 20 he was getting better so we came back to the ward. Um, we started to wean his decks um, and uh, by about this point I would have said this is all fine, you know this is just severe eye cans, this is fairly typical. Um, the way it appeared was fairly typical, like speech, language, um, you know, the sort of encephalopathy that I described. And then day plus 25, it, things changed. He became agitated, continent of urine, um, his ice score was zero. So he's, he's then called grade three ICANS. Um, but after, after being grade zero ICANS, he's then got worse again to grade three ICANS at day plus 25. And I find this history alarming and um, I would be very, very resistant to just all automatically presuming that this is sort of second ICANS. I think you have to very have to have a very um, strong um, index of suspicion for the things. So the next day uh, he improved a little bit um, and then over the next few days his ice scale was very fluctuant, which is also a bit not typical for ICANS. They, they tend to get worse or they tend to get better. Um, we gave him more steroids because you sort of feel like you need to. And then he had a sudden profound um, drop in his sodium, um, which was consistent with SIADH. He had some hypotonic saline. Um, we still felt that maybe we should treat him for ICANS, so we gave him a second dose of siltuximab. Um, and he had a repeat MRI. And that's where the fact that he'd had an MRI on day 16 was incredibly helpful because we had you know, a really good baseline. And on day plus 35, he's got bilateral um, uptake in his hippocampi, um, which is fitting with viral encephalitis. Um, he also was septic, uh, E. coli was grown, he had a repeat LP, this time with very increased white cells. Um, and we identified HHV6 DNA in his CSF with a very low CT value, which was very convincing. So we started him on Foscarnet. Um, and he sort of went into a, a really negative spiral of sepsis, um, uncontrolled um, encephalitis. So he was aspirating, it was intubated, ended up perforating. He'd had a lot of steroids and died of multi-organ failure after a high-risk laparotomy. 
um, on day plus 51. So this was actually our second case. And I have to say the first case was very, very spookily similar in that it was somebody who had severe CRS, better, very obvious icons at a very typical time point, day 10, 11, um, got better. And then after day 20, had a second neurological deterioration, which was very different in character, um, much more like a delirious um, change, uh, you know, uh, decline in his neurological status. Um, and this was the first patient we had, which was back in March 2021, which we wrote up as a case report. Um, and I just think it's interesting because you know, we, we wrote that up and then in, in January of this year, a series of them were put together, including quoting hours um, in the New England Journal of Medicine for HHV6 being now a recognised complication of, of CAR-T. And it's it's a class effect, so I don't think it's specific to one of the products because um, the New England paper had cases from Axacel and Antisogen. Um, and this has since been added to the product label, so um, HHV6 has been uh, recognised by the company as well as 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 a potential. It's I mean it's incredibly rare, but it's 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 really is devastating, and I think you just have to keep it in the back of your mind. One of the reasons why it's so important is because for both of the patients we've had that have had this, you know, they've had typical ICANs. We did CSF MRI, nothing, nothing remarkable. Then the second deterioration, day plus twenty five, and we've seen. It, the results are completely different. The MRI for both patients showed marked uh, bilateral hippocampal changes. In both patients, the CSF showed HHV6 uh, with a low CT value. And for both those patients, the first CSF we had done, we had done HHV6. So we knew that it was new. Um, and a, a learning point for us in terms of trying to improve the outcome of this scenario is just being involved with speaking with the virologist because uh, HHV6 is generally a, a send away test and usually if you just leave them to their own devices they will send it to the reference centre and you'll get a result back in two weeks which is obviously completely unhelpful. So at Kings we, we have an in-house uh, assay um, which they'll do within 24 hours which is really essential for managing um, uh, guiding management. So I uh, would say um, it's important to think of a differential when pa patients have a neurological deterioration post CAR-T um, super seizures is not a diagnosis. We haven't seen too many seizures, but we certainly have. And typically around the day plus eight, nine mark. Um, certainly in the old tessigen patients, uh, we've seen quite a bit of sepsis, delirium, uh, which isn't ICANS. Uh, limbic encephalitis. So I've talked to you about the two HHV6 patients that we had. And, and just like London buses, we've just had two cases of HHV7 encephalitis. So again, both with a second neurological deterioration, day plus 25 onwards. Um, but thankfully, HHV7 is, is is much less severe, so it doesn't seem to cause the, the, the massive cognitive impairment. So both patients had a sort of delirious cognitive decline, rapid, rapid deterioration, and have got better over a week, 10 days. Um, so that's interesting. Managerial relapse definitely can masquerade as ICANS. Evasive aspergillosis, we saw one case of very extreme uh, rapid neurological deterioration, but also sort of multi-organ failure. We did a PM and we found invasive aspergillosis. So for us, that made us change our uh, antifungal prophylaxis to prosoconazole for all CAR-T patients. Serious HLH, I mean, you'll be used to seeing HLH. Um, obviously, these patients are very sick. Cerebral hemorrhage we have seen, and we've had one case of progressive multifocal leukencephalopathy um, a year post CAR-T, and she died from that, unfortunately. So anakinra we're very keen on. If you look at the UK data, um, it's pretty much an Axacel affair. So in the UK, 12.6% of patients who have received Axacel have received anakinra. The predominant indication for anakinra was grade three and above ICANs, uh, but some patients with grade three and above CRS. The median start date was day plus eight. The median duration was six days. Um, centers definitely are doing a range of dosing, but I think the most common uh, dosing is 200 milligrams subcutaneous daily. Um, most of these, well, most, a lot of these patients still died. Um, they, they, I mean, we, we're trying to use it really as a steroid sparing agent, but these patients still did have a lot of steroids. Um, but I mean, we, it, there's no, there's no robust clinical trials. So uh, this is, this is an anecdotal uh, management strategy, but certainly there's belief in the field that this works. Uh, one of the more interesting um, CAR-T presentations I saw, Ash, last year, 
um, was this discussion regarding anakinrin's prophylaxis. So they are using anakinrin from day plus two, uh, and they can increase the dose um, if there's ongoing toxicity. Um, and they saw quite significantly reduced rates of tox in the axicel cohort. In the Takata patients, still significant tox, but the, I mean, this is four patients, so it's a very small number. So really, we need to see the, the, the proper published outcome of this trial. Um, this is Memorial Sloan Kettering. MD Anderson also have an anakinrin prophylaxis trial, which is not reported. So I'll be really, really interested to see um, what the outcome of that. But that is certainly that is certainly a way I think, you know, this could all go, like the identification of CAR-T patients who are at high risk of tox and the use of anakinrin prophylaxis. I've sort of touched on this already, um, but I suppose just to show you in a in a chart, when we started the CAR-T program, we sort of had to use um, this approach, which was uh, tocilizumab only for grade two CRS um, and steroids for grade two um, ICANs, and because that was what was defined by NHS England, what we were, what was reimbursed. Um, for Kings, when we when when COVID happened, we changed to this approach, which is a cohort four, which is a, a uh, a, a cohort of SUMA1 where they had a different management, CAR T toxicity management strategy. Um, so we give TOSI for grade one or two, but that's a clinical decision from the attending consultant. Um, and we give um, a dose of steroids for grade one ICANs, which not all UK centres are doing. Uh, cohort six of SUMA1 is the look, is the use of dexamethasone uh, as prophylaxis for um, CAR T tox. So basically, they get a dose of dex on day zero, one, two. I mean, I'm not that comfortable with the idea of giving someone a dose of dex with their CAR T infusion, because obviously, you know, on the protocols it says you know you can't give like pre pre met hydrocortisone, so it feels a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm not I'm not I'm not pr proposing proposing that particular strategy, but I, I I am in favor of the cohort four strategy, which is basically what the King strategy is. This is a busy slide, um, but it's just to sort of summarize the main point. And I think the main learning point is 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 how much dex do you end up giving you know a group of patients when you when you take a different approach. So the initial trials in one cohort one two um, uses a very reactive steroid um, approach, you know, waiting for significant toxicity. So over the whole population, the median dex dose is one nine one. But if you take a cohort four approach, which is the which is what I've tried to explain the King's what we changed the King's approach to, which is sort of very proactive steroid usage. Um, Certainly in, in the trial in cohort four, you end up um, use, giving individual patients um, a, a much lower dexamethasone dose. In terms of the UK data, um, it's a mixed bag, so we're sort of somewhere between these two. But obviously this is data collected from all of the UK, UK CAR-T centres and people, centres are doing different things. So you can't read too much in, into that, but I, I am a fan of early steroids. Um, how can we prevent severe ICANs? Or just ask yourself the question, is it definitely ICANs? Um, yeah, so we, we do give a stat dose of dex for grade one ICANs, um, but wean early um, if, if if patient improves. We change to POSA, cytokine level, guided management I didn't talk about. Anakinra is still of anecdotal benefit with no um, robust trial data, but certainly we add it in um, after 24 hours of high dose steroids if no improvement. Um, I think patient selection and, and good bridging definitely helps. So polituzumab, I think, has helped the UK CAR-T programme enormously because we just have patients coming in in a much more stable state than they were before we had access. So tuxumab, we do in extreme situations. Um, there is some limited data about giving patients refractory ICANs and intrathecal chemotherapy, but I think there may be a strong publication bias in this. I, I do wonder how many people have actually tried this and not worked and not reported it. So, but that is certainly something that could be done um, in a desperate situation. Um, the UK data has been published in full long. We probably talked about it earlier. Um, this was from a year ago when we had to be a bit more balanced about not talking about the two products. But this was this was the PFS and overall survival curves from the UK data as it was a year ago. Um, so I think my main conclusions, I've got some of the some extra slides as well. So we are using a lot more toxin steroids in real world practice. I think that's fine. Um, you we you do you will always get high tox with with axicel and tisogen. That's just the nature of the products. But in reality, we are seeing much less severe neurotoxicity nationally than we were expecting from Zuma One. So that's very reassuring that we are doing the right thing. Um, performance status and active disease coming into CAR T um, is predictive of high grade CAR T toxicity. 
Um, non relapse mortality is definitely high with XSL, but our overall survival outcomes and the UK data actually is, is fine. It's in line with Zuma 1, so I think that's not a problem. Um, and steroid use, I suppose the most important point, um, steroid use for CAR-T toxicity does not negatively impact uh, PFS and OS in the UK data set. Uh, some final bits um, for new centres. Um, so one of the one of the JCIEC clinical programme standards is an annual audit, a compulsory annual audit of safety endpoints. Um, so if you actually when you actually try and do that, you realise that there's no there's no actual audit standards. Um, unless you so your choices are auditing against Zuma One and the Juliet data, I would say it's probably more appropriate to audit against the UK data because that's more more relevant. Um, and I think I think also if you cannot do this, you probably need to separate by products. You know, it doesn't make much sense to bring the myeloma in with the lymphoma patients when you when you're looking at this. Um, but that is a, a required um, IEC um, quality audit. Um, when patients return to CAR-T centres, I think one learning point to keep stressing, you know, I have not seen a CAR-T protocol that doesn't have fludarabine in it, so just make sure patients, uh, when they go to small hospitals, that they, they need they need irradiated blood products. Um, it's OK to give steroids when people deteriorate post-CAR-T. Post I think people, some, some people are still a bit nervous about that, because relapse is the most common problem after CAR-T. Long cytopenias um, uh, are a problem in about a third of patients. Um, we've seen this a lot now. Usually, they usually it just settles on its own. Every time I've done a bone marrow in this situation, I found an empty bone marrow, which has not been particularly helpful. So I'm, I'm a lot less keen on doing bone marrows for prolonged cytopenia's post CAR T now. Um, I mean, in ALL, obviously, it would be different, but in high grade lymphoma, you have to be, you just it's very unlikely to see disease in that context immediately post post CAR T. Some of them respond to GCSF, some of them don't. Uh, you know, I think you have to be conscious that people go back to a referring centre um, and often the CAR-T cytopenia kicks in, you know, weeks four, week five. So depending on what your local antifungal prophylaxis policies are, you know, they need to be re-escalated to POSA or whatever you use um, if this happens, because it is predominantly neutropenia, um, but it can be, um, there are some people needing transfusions for a few weeks, but it's not usually too intense. Um, we recommend COVID direct revaccination at three months, um, and the uh, you know the NHS policy about uh, COVID antivirals is for two years post CAR T infusion. Um, HIV Hep PC obviously when we're doing monitoring in, in those sorts of patients, um, and just a, uh, another point about TOSI, you know it, it really is quite potent suppressor of the inflammatory response for sometimes a number of weeks afterwards. So if the CRP goes up after CAR T, then obviously that's believable. But but if the CRP stays uh, zero or one, however the lab measure it, I, you know, I just take it with a bit of a pinch of salt sometimes because I think it can be very um, suppressed for, for a lot longer than you would think. Uh, are we? Yeah. Okay, so I can wrap up. So this is just uh, where things are, where we are at King's. So we've uh, we've, and it's, we've got quite an extensive CAR-T trial programme. Um, a lot of them just sort of delivering CAR-T in earlier lines. Uh, Ruben Benjamin is very involved with the BCMA CAR-T trial, so we've got quite a bit of experience now with BCMA CAR-T, which is really very different experience. Um, the future, um, which will be of interest, is, is, is what cells do we use for CAR-T? Um, the, the, in the autologous space, you know, the companies are trying to enrich for um, earlier, uh, less terminally differentiated T cells. Allergenic CAR T trials are ongoing, but I think there's significant challenges with Allah CAR T, uh, uh, not uh, particularly yeah, the, the use of CAMPATH, uh, long term minor suppression, cytopenia infections. So I don't, as much as Allah CAR T sounds like a wonderful idea, I think the, the reality of it is quite difficult. Um, uh, my colleague Andrea Kungel um, has a radiotherapy consolidation post CAR T uh, trial protocol set up, which will be really interesting. So we're, we're quite keen on offering radiotherapy consolidation based on the one month PET scan result now. Uh, for anyone interested in CAR T fellowships, uh, we have one. That's it.